Howdy, Tibor Source Rex here. We're going to finally show you how to fill out a calc form. In this video, we're just going to dive straight in and uh, start filling these things out. And then we're going to come back shortly after this video and we're going to show you how to actually construct a calc form that works best for you and the primary functions tables, which are going to be essential. They're a part of the calc form system and the secondary functions as well. And we're going to discuss in detail some of the advantages and disadvantages of setting these tables up in various ways and uh, explaining how these things work and why we chose to arrange them in the fashion which we did. There are some prerequisites to this video. If you don't understand some of the, the basic concepts we've discussed earlier in the series, none of this is going to make any sense. You're going to have to have a pretty good uh, comprehension of external and internal ballistics. You're going to have to basically understand your barometric pressure adjustments. Your muzzle velocity variation is going to be very important. Uh, so if you're, if you're not familiar with the muzzle velocity variation temperature curve for your ammunition and uh, also how bore conditions can change muzzle velocity over time, you're going to want to go back and catch the videos on bore erosion mechanisms and uh, internal ballistics so that you know what we're talking about because that's going to be a very important component when drawing up a detailed firing solution for very long ranges. You're going to have to understand obviously your atmospheric effects like ambient air temperature. You're going to have to understand Coriolis drift and humidity. There's some misconceptions about humidity so you're going to want to catch our video on that. Also we're going to have to understand the wind systems uh, for the different angles that we're going to use like the clock method and the cosine, angle cosines to determine how much we're going to adjust things. Spin drift and we're going to also introduce you to target lead as well. And later on we're going to get into the sec secondary functions. We're not going to really use those today but uh, we're just going to go ahead and start out by filling out the calc form right off the bat. Another important thing to note here is that we are not the author of the calc form idea. That's uh, something that's been used for some time, particularly in the uh, hard target interdiction circles. And uh, our calc forms are custom tailored more for precision riflemen who aren't using theodolites to range their targets. These are meant more for our, our standard applications. If you are going to be doing actual hard target interdiction with the, with the anti-material rifles like this, and you're going to be scud hunting and you're going to be surveying your targets to determine the ranges, you might want to use the hard target interdiction manual calc forms. There are a few more pages than these. These are, have been uh, con condensed uh, considerably compared with the original HTI calc forms that are in the manual. So uh, these are meant to be a lot more easy to use and streamlined and uh, arranged in a different fashion that's a little more... Um, user friendly as far as the units we don't utilize constants uh, this is my third generation of calc form that I've modified and uh, some of the originals use ballistic constants but uh, we'll explain in a later video how we've set ours up to actually be usable measurements uh, and they're all basically straight angular measurements that are incremented in such a way to where you can actually understand what's going on rather than by uh, using just mathematically derived constants. And we'll explain in more detail what we're talking about right there. So uh, these are kind of similar to, and uh, they look very similar to the HTI calc forms, but they are set up very differently. All right, let's take a closer look at the actual calc form and the primary functions. So the two most important parts of the system here that you're going to be needing to pay attention to. As we said before, our calc form is simply a cheat sheet which walks us through how to apply the ballistic information on this primary functions table. Okay, Now our primary functions are based on a set of standard conditions. Okay, And if you look over here, the designated standards that we chose was based on our uh, conditions that we have around here, okay? So we have uh, 50 cal is what we're gonna be pretending like we're gonna shoot today, a 750 grain AMAX, 
2,815 feet per second at 60 degrees air temperature and ammo temperature. So that's your muzzle velocity at that ammo temperature. And the other condition is 27 inches of mercury for our altitude is standard here and 0% humidity. We're just going to assume it's going to be very dry. Okay, so that's our designated standard conditions. Your designated standards will vary depending on where you're at. So when we set up our primary functions table after a while, you'll, uh, I'll show you how to uh, determine what your designated standards should be uh, to get the most logical uh, results on that. So what we have here is we have all our different adjustments that we're going to be applying to our base firing solution. And our base firing solution is what we're going to call the super elevation. And that's basically the drop values for this bullet under these conditions. As these conditions vary, we will have to adjust these drop values accordingly. And these are the numbers which list how much those things will change based per uh, you know the change. So the barometric pressure, every time it changes one inch of mercury at a thousand meters, you're going to have to change your elevation setting by 0.26 minutes of angle. Okay. Likewise with the muzzle velocity variation, for every 10 feet per second difference at 1300 meters, you're going to have to adjust by 0.29 minutes of angle and so forth. So that's kind of what's going on here. These are the adjustments. This is our base values here in the blue, our super elevation values. Uh, the relationships and all the different details that come into play when actually going through the process are somewhat complicated. That's why we have the actual calc form here. It would be possible just to operate with the primary functions table if you were a stud out in the field, uh, but it's probably best to have this calc form to help guide you through until you get really used to it. So the calc form is uh, you're going to fill in your primary critical need to know information first on the top. You're going to have to determine your true range to the target and then you're going to have to figure out your actual horizontal range so that we can make the appropriate adjustments. And then we're going to plug in the correction values that we had listed over here for the given range that we're shooting at based on this box up here. And we're going to enter these values, the appropriate values, into these boxes. And then we'll have the information ready to go for this particular range that we're looking at for our designated target area. And then after we have these values, we'll be able to tweak those values based on our current measured conditions and how they vary from the designated standards, which was shown over here by our base elevation or our super elevation settings. So we'll adjust fire based on the varying conditions and this shows you how to get through the math. Likewise with the traverse corrections down here. So let's take a look at a situation which would warrant the use of a calc form. Now it's important to note that these calc forms are not going to be very handy if you need to apply uh, fire quickly on the fly. Okay, And what I mean by that is if a deer pops out at 800 yards and starts running over the hill, you're not going to have time to screw around with a calc form. You're going to want to use the hasty ballistic tables like we showed you how to construct earlier. However, most long range applications are uh, under a situation where you're going to pick out a final firing position ahead of time. You're going to conduct extensive mission planning for whatever uh, operation you're going to be conducting. And you're going to know your basic idea of where your target zone is going to be ahead of time. And you would fill out this calc form, at least get most of the crucial stuff filled out ahead of time. This would be in your mission planning phase. Um, or when you're uh, out in the field and you're starting to drop your range cards and you designate different possible target zones, that's when you would fill in the critical need to know information and you would tweak it over here based on the math as stuff changes. And we'll show you how that plays out. But here's our first scenario that we're going to use for an example. This is a topographical map I kind of made up of a potential target area, okay? Here we have our final firing position situated kind of on the military crest of this hill. We got a river running through here. And let's say we're going to anticipate that a target is going to make its way down this game trail and it's going to eventually have to stop and drink some water right here. 
Now, we don't want to necessarily take a shot at extreme long ranges on a moving target. If we can avoid that, that's best. So in our mission planning phase, when we're out there in the field and when we're looking at our maps, um, and a lot of hunters really have this stuff squared away months in advance. They basically know uh, what kind of game they're going to ambush wherever it is they're operating. Uh, but we're going to say that at the end of this game trail is a watering hole where the critters are most likely going to go and stop and drink some water. That's a perfect place to set up a kelp for them ahead of time. Okay. Um, now, obviously, for most hunting type purposes, I would not recommend shooting at extreme long range, but this is just a good example to use to show you how the calc forms work. This would be more applicable probably for military applications where you needed a, a safe distance between you and the target. If you're hunting, you could get a lot closer in most circumstances. Um, just for a side note, just in case this seems a little funny. But we'll say we're shooting at deer for right now, okay? So we're going to have the target, it's going to stop at this watering hole, or it could have to stop to climb down the bank and cross the river, whatever the situation may be. You anticipate the target is going to stop here. This is your designated target zone. So you're going to fill out a calc form for this. And your measured conditions uh, that you're anticipating at the time you think the target's going to arrive here, let's say the target usually comes down this road and waters right at uh, dusk. So you can look ahead at the weather and anticipate what the weather's going to be like. And uh, this is also in the mission planning phase. We'll get into that more later. But you're going to try to guess as close as you can what the weather's going to be like. And if you're wrong, you'll adjust it at, on the fly. But we'll say we're anticipating uh, conditions of 25.7 inches of mercury for barometric pressure. Okay. Uh, ammo temperature, we're going to keep that at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And we'll show you more on how to do stuff like that later. It's going to be at the end of the day, we'll say. And your ammo is going to be nice and hot from sitting out there. Uh, your bore conditions. Uh, your, your bore conditions are in the hump. That means if you watched our bore erosion videos and our, our uh, barrel break-in videos, that's when the micro fractures and the steel start to build up and you gain a little pressure. And as your bore life changes, the, the dimensions of the bore and the character of those surfaces, you're going to have a a variation in muzzle velocity like we discussed in those muzzle velocity variation videos. So our bore conditions right now are in what they call the hump where they're a little faster than usual. And our air temperature that we're going to be expecting around that time, the target presents itself 65 degrees. Humidity is probably going to be about 15%. So let's fill out a calc form. All right. And we'll get into more detail on this uh, the situation here as we fill out the calc form, okay? Where's my pencil? All right. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see what's going on here. Okay. First thing you're going to need to determine is the true range to the target. Now, that is the actual line of sight from you to the target. That's not talking about actual horizontal range. If you're looking straight down from outer space, that's talking about the actual amount of air that the bullet's going to have to fight through to get to the target. This is what we're going to use to uh, base our atmospheric corrections on. So simply range the target from your position. You can use a laser or you can use GPS if you had uh, the appropriate information. You can use the mill dots in your scope and you can uh, use a mill dot master, something like this here to find out your range or you could... Um, you know, there's various ways you could do this. You could use a theodolite to survey it. You should be able to verify your range. This is very important to get this right. So we'll say that we checked it with the mill dot master. We milled it in the scope. We'll pretend like we are using a mill dot scope. And uh, let's say there's a fence right in this vicinity. Uh, and fences are like 48 inches tall. Okay. So here's our 48 inch tall fence. Uh, we're going to look in the 48. And we'll show you how to use mill dot master later. And uh, it takes up 0.8 mils in the scope, almost a full mil. Okay, uh, it's going to indicate that our range is uh, 1,500 meters. Okay, so we're, and we verify that with all our other uh, units of measurement. The laser agreed, and your GPS and your maps all everything agreed. 1,500 meters. That's a nice round number to work with for a first problem. So that is our true range. Next thing you're going to have to determine is your actual horizontal range. Now in our situation here, we're firing from an elevated position, shooting down. And our angle of fire is 30 degrees. Let's say we're shooting down slope 30 degrees. That's gonna 
be pretty significant. So let's take a look at this. In order to figure out your actual horizontal range, we have the formula right here. Actual horizontal range equals the angle of fire, the cosine of the angle of fire, multiplied by the true range. Okay? Now you can use one of these tools, a uh, dope sloper, and you can uh, get down to 30 degrees, and you just line this up with uh, your, your tilt or your slope, and then you pinch it off, and it'll give you the cosine right here, okay? Um, but for us, we're just going to figure that out, and then we take the cosine and multiply it by the true range. So the cosine of 30 degrees, okay, I'll just write this on here so you can see what I'm doing, times 1,500 meters, that's this number right here, okay? The cosine of that, if you type it up in your calculator, is 1,299. And I'll do one of these with you just so you can see how to, how to type that in. Here's our scientific calculator. Okay. You need the cosine of 30 degrees. Okay. Times 1,500 meters equals 1,299 meters. Okay. So that's our actual horizontal range. Now that we have these two base criteria, we had to know our true range and we have to know our actual horizontal range if we want to determine our correction values, okay? Now you're going to want to interpolate the exact values from your primary functions tables. So if you don't remember how to do interpolation, and what we mean by that is if uh, we're going to look up these correction values based on our ranges, okay? So if our range is 1,500 meters, we're going to have to find 1,500 meters, our correction value, per every one inch of mercury change is going to be 0.75 minutes of angle, okay? Now, if uh, there was some distance in between 1,500 and 1,600, you'd have to interpolate the difference between these two and go back in those videos and see how that's done. And we'll do this in a more complicated one when we're practicing later on and undoubtedly when we're in the field. But for now, it's a nice even 1,500 meters for our true range, okay? And the nice thing about this calc form is it's telling us that we need to use the true range right here to determine this value. So our barometric pressure correction value at 1,500 meters is 0.75 minutes of angle, okay? Then we're going to look at the actual horizontal range, 299, to determine our muzzle velocity variation correction value. And if we look on the primary functions table under... We're going to use 1,300 meters because that's real close to 1,299. And that correction value is going to be 0 0.29. We're going to use the true range to look at our ambient air temperature. That's going to be 0.035. Or, sorry, that's going to be 0.35 minutes of angle. Actual horizontal range for the vertical Coriolis because that's a spatial correction um, based on the spin of the Earth. So that's not going to be... Uh, dependent on the true range, it doesn't care how much atmosphere you're fighting, it's spatial correction. So that's why for that we're using the actual horizontal range here, and that's going to be 0.31 according to our primary functions table. And our humidity adjustment is another atmospheric constant, uh, so we're going to use the full true range, that's how much air we're fighting through at 1500 meters, and that's our correction value for that. Okay, now that you have those determined, we're going to want to figure out our super elevation value so that we know how much we're going to have to tweak that value and get our final elevation setting after we adjust for the varying conditions. So we need to look on our primary functions table here and our super elevation is based on actual horizontal range because it's gravitationally derived, okay, based on the actual horizontal range distance like we discussed in an early video on angle of fire. So at 1,300 meters, which is our actual horizontal range to the target, our correction is going to be 36 minutes of angle elevation. So we're going to write that in there. That's an extremely important number to have down. What that means is you would apply 36 minutes of angle elevation to your scope to hit a target at an actual horizontal range of 1,299 meters, which is 1,500 meters with a slope of 30 degrees. So that's where you would adjust your scope for standard conditions at this point. Now, as conditions vary, that number is going to get tweaked. Okay, so like we said before, 
Our conditions are not standard conditions. Our designated standard for barometric pressure was 27 inches of mercury, but here we have 25.7. So there's a difference we need to correct for. In order to do that, we simply follow the formula. Now each one of these has a little walkthrough on how to do the math. Pretty simple. So we're going to take 27, which is this first number here is going to vary based on your uh, your designated standards, but our designated standard was 27 inches of mercury. So that's going to take that, 27 inches of mercury, measure, uh, minus our measured barometric pressure, which we said during our conditions was uh, 25.7. That's 25.7. Okay? And we're going to take uh, that number and multiply it by the correction value which was 0.75 right up here that we had written down already okay for our range and uh, we're gonna simply do the math on that and it should be pretty simple how that works uh, 27 inches of mercury find the difference between that and what we actually measured there's the difference in barometric pressure I'm gonna take that times the correction value and that gives us 0.975 minutes of angle adjustment 0.975. Okay, now being that the pressure is lower than our designated standards, where we're going to shoot, we're going to have a negative value, which means that instead of adding this number to our original firing solution, you're going to subtract it when we start adding all these things up at the end. So that's how that works. Okay, so the next most important thing we're going to need to correct for, and these are arranged in a semi-logical order uh, based on prioritization of how much these different things could potentially affect you. So muzzle velocity variation is very important, um, especially if your ammo temperature is different than what you measured your velocity for when you designated your standard conditions. Okay, So this correct for muzzle velocity variation, in order to do that, we're going to have to keep our logs and understand what we're going to anticipate for muzzle velocity. So we said in this problem here that our standard muzzle velocity is 2815 feet per second, okay? But our ammo temperature, we're going to anticipate it to be 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, based on our muzzle velocity variation curve on ammo temperature, that we discussed in an earlier video, we can kind of take a guess here and get a pretty good idea. So according to the curve, we would be right around 2860 or so feet per second rather than 2815 because as the ammo heats up, it's going to speed up a little bit due to the chemistry of the powder heating up, okay? However, we also noted in our conditions here for our frying solution that the bore conditions were in the hump of the bore. So the, the barrel's starting to break in and we have a little bit, we have recorded in our muzzle velocity variation table here that the muzzle velocities are a little bit higher lately during the hump, okay? So we can anticipate, if you follow it over, uh, muzzle velocity is going to be 2,900 feet a second if our temperature is at 80 degrees in our current hump of the barrel. Did you get all that? Okay, hopefully you did. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take our standard, and I'll zoom in a little again for you. Standard muzzle velocity was what? 2815. That's on our primary functions table if you forget what you designated for your standards. Okay. We're going to subtract the corrected muzzle velocity, which we just said was 2900. And don't worry about the positives and the negatives because we're going to sign that later on. Okay. Then you're going to take that number, divide it by 10, because we are basically taking every 10 feet per second. So we're going to break that down. That's just a little math deal there. Don't worry about that. Times the correction value, which was 0.29. Okay. And that's going to equal our correction. And if you figure all that stuff out in the calculator, it's going to come up with a correction of uh, 2.755. And it goes on for a while. Okay. And being that it's warmer, that means our ammo is... Uh, Heat it up, it's going to be shooting faster, you're going to need less drops, so we're going to subtract this from the firing solution as indicated here. 
Pretty neat, huh? How this kind of works. Helps you walk through the problem. Okay, now let's correct for ambient air temperature. Our designated standards were 60 degrees Fahrenheit according to our primary functions, what our super elevation was based for, but we're anticipating temperatures of 65 degrees, five degrees warmer. So we're gonna take 60 degrees minus the measured air temperature, or the one we're anticipating, 65, okay? Divided by 10, just to break her down, times the correction value, which was, what was our correction value? Look up here, ambient air temperature correction value is 0.35. And we're gonna simply work that out. We're gonna have five divided by 10 is 0.5 times 0.35 is 0.175. And again, being that it's warmer than our designated standards, uh, the air is more thin, therefore it's gonna strike high, therefore you need to get this reduced off your original firing solution up here that we had for a super elevation, okay? Pretty cool, it's walking you through everything to make sure you don't screw it up too bad. Pretty handy. Now we need to correct for vertical Coriolis effect. If you remember from our Cori Coriolis effect video, if you're shooting due east or due west, you're going to have a full value of this Coriolis effect. And this is your elevation, your vertical, up and down. So our target is at 15 degrees, okay, from due north. So that's our direction of fire is 15 degrees. However, we're not going to measure it that because we're going to designate, and it says it right here in the calc form, which is kind of handy, direction of fire. You're going to need the cosine of the direction of fire, but your full value, you're going to designate your full value to be due east or west, whatever way you're pointed. And then you're going to take that times your correction factor, okay? Let's make a little more sense of this dope sloper. If we designate zero degrees as being due east or due west for this portion of vertical Coriolis effect, because it's going to be maximum due east, 100%, you know, of the correction is going to be due east or due west. As you veer off of due east or due west, it's going to reduce it. So that's why we get our cosine. So let's point this sucker due east, okay? Lay it down. Let's say we'd have a compass out there in the field. And uh, there's a firing position. We're at due east. It's going to be 15 degrees from due north, but we're going to really be 75 degrees from due east. So 75 degrees, what's the cosine of 75? It's going to be in between 0.34 and 0.17. Well, if you work that out with your scientific calculator, to be even more precise, let's write this out first just so you can see what I'm doing here. I'm going to take the 90 degrees minus the 15, because we're not talking about do So 75 degrees, so we need the cosine of 75 degrees times the correction value right up here. Oh, man, oh, man. Danger zone. So, cosine of 75. Boom. Is that much? It's going to be about 25% of uh, the, the value because we're mostly pointed north and south, as you can see. We're not going to have a whole lot of the vertical Coriolis effect because we're not hardly even pointing to our west. So we're only going to apply 25% of it, Okay. 25% of the correction value, which a full correction would have been 0.31 minutes of angle. So take that number times 0.31, and there we go. That gives you the answer, which is 0.08. And being that we're shooting east, that means as you shoot, like we discussed in our video, the target's going to be falling out of view and you're going to have to reduce this from your firing solution. If you're shooting due west, then you would need to add this to your firing solution. So this is dependent on direction of fire. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch the Coriolis Effect video. Very important to understand. Uh, correct for humidity. Now humidity has a very tiny effect, as you can see in the primary functions, but we're going to correct for it anyways because we are at 1,500 meters and we're shooting at a relatively small target. Our measured humidity, what did we say? 15%. Okay, so 0.15 is how you would write 15% mathematically, right? 0.15 times the correction value is 0.03. And that's not gonna be a whole lot. You type it up, it's gonna be like less than a little bit. But we're gonna add it in anyways, just so that when it all sums up, we're pretty close. And you're always gonna subtract if you've designated 
0% as your standard, and that's an easy way to go, actually. So we're going to subtract that from the base frying solution as well. Now all you simply do to find out your final elevation setting is we're going to sum up all these numbers. We have one big positive number, a super elevation, and the rest just so happen to work out this time to all be subtracted from this. So we're going to take 36 minus this number, minus this number, minus this number, minus this number, minus this number. If one of these was positive, you'd add that in there, okay? So once you figure all that out, your final elevation setting will be about 32.01 minutes of angle. Now it's interesting, you can look at this and you can see by how much you would have missed for each one of these individual components if you had not corrected for it. If you wouldn't have corrected for your ammunition temperature, uh, muzzle velocity variation, you would have missed by almost three minutes of angle at 1500 meters. That would have been a few feet, okay? You would have missed. So it's a good thing we corrected for it. Uh, if you would have missed the humidity, Correction, you probably wouldn't have missed a whole lot because it's just a tiny amount here. That's what's kind of neat about looking at this calc form is it'll show you what's going on. And you might ask, why am I only filling out the boxes on the right? And why are they darker than the ones on the left? Well, this particular calc form, and there's different variations of it that I'm going to include. This one is set up for an optical configuration, a, a mil dot scope with minute of angle turrets. Now, in this 50 I'm using right here, that's actually not the scope configuration, but I wanted to demonstrate how this would work for you. Um, these are my recommended ways of designating which way you want to correct for these things, okay? Uh, most of your elevation corrections are going to be constant at, for this target. You fill out one calc form per target area, okay? So... I would not recommend holding off any of these values if you can have the option of indexing it in the scope. Now, if you have a horse radical or something, you might want to fill out your hold off. But this is kind of neat, and we'll show you when we get into more dynamics firing solutions later. Sometimes you would want to correct for certain things by indexing it on the scope, on the turrets, and then save other things that are more variable that can change more quickly and just hold off as needed for those. And then you could separate those two components into two separate parts of the firing solution so you wouldn't get them confused. And you'll see later why, uh, why that's very important. And this is also why I stress the use of first focal plane optics so that you can actually use the reticle for hold-offs and depend on them. To uh, There's a lot of stuff going on here. You don't want to have to worry about your magnification value being correct to match your second focal plane. That's why we're stressing that. And you'll see a little more on the traverse settings. So we designated for this optical configuration in this situation right here that we're just going to do everything. We're going to index it all on the optic. We're not going to hold over for anything. So dial that in on your scope right there, that number right there. Okay. Now if something changes, you can simply come back and retype in the formula, erase this, uh, write in the new number and then recalculate this on the fly. But it'll be a lot more quick once you have the primary stuff figured out ahead of time to tweak it on the fly. Okay, now let's go ahead and calculate our traverse settings. And uh, we simply look at our primary functions and look at the true range for our windage hold off. That's in units of mils because we're going to hold off in mils for mil dot scope, obviously, right? 1.7 mils per. 10 mile an hour uh, windage difference, that's for a full value. Our indexed windage would be, what would that be? That would be 0 0.590 minutes of angle if we're going to dial it on the optic. Okay, that's for a full hold off per 10 mile an hour. Uh, our spin drift is going to be constant. That's going to be 1.40. That's also based on true range because that's an atmospherically derived correction. Our horizontal Coriolis is actually based on actual horizontal range because that's a spatial correction based on the spin of the earth again. So uh, horizontal Coriolis is going to be 0 0.55 minutes of angle at uh, 1300 meters, uh, 1299 for actual horizontal range. Okay, And then if we have a target moving every one feet per second uh, that it's moving in speed, you're going to have to lead at this distance half a mil. Okay. And uh, in the, the way we have our primary functions table set up on this one, it is set up in mils because you're not going to dial in to, uh, you know, lead lead a target with your indexing your scope. That's that'd be silly. If we look at our target situation here, we have wind, 
and we're having wind directly from the west going to the east, okay? And we're saying that the wind, when we measured it, uh, was 8 to 12 miles per hour on average. And we're going to explain more of this in a coming video, but you're going to want to take multiple wind measurements. You're going to at least want to take a wind measurement at your final firing position. You're going to want to at least get one around here at your max ordinate. And you're going to want to get a wind reading down here at the target. The more wind readings you can get along the bullet path, the better off you're going to be. You're going to average those out and determine an average wind speed and direction for the entire throw here. Okay, That's going to be important. You don't want to just take the wind with your anemometer reading at your final firing position because on the side of this hill, once you get over this open valley, the wind's going to be a lot more strong in here. Okay, We discussed that in an earlier video. So when I'm talking about this is your wind, this is your average wind speed and direction over the course of this firing solution, okay? So our average wind speed, like we said earlier, uh, we'll say 10 miles an hour over the course of the entire uh, distance that the bullet's traveling at the FFP, the max sword, and the target at a minimum. Okay, now that we have our correction values in here, we can use them to adjust for the differences in the conditions that we're experiencing in the field uh, from our designated standard conditions again. So let's go ahead and correct for windage. Well, in our situation here, our average wind speed was 10, but it's at an angle to us. We're shooting this way. We're shooting up into the north-northeast here. And our wind is about 15 degrees off from being a direct crosswind. Here's our, uh, if it was a direct crosswind, it would be pointing like this, but we're about like this. That's about 15 degrees from a full value. Or if we're pointing this way, the wind is going to be coming from our 8 o'clock, maybe 8.15 position if you're using the clock method. Now, um, you can use the clock method if you want, but I would strongly recommend at extreme range, if you're going through all the trouble doing the calc form, to actually do the angular correction and use cosines, okay? That's going to help you out a lot better. So let's get back in here. So our average wind speed was 10 miles an hour divided by 10, according to the formula here, uh, times the wind angle, the cosine of the wind angle is a 15 degree angle. Okay, and we're going to basically take that times 1.7 to get our hold off in mils, and that's going to work out to be 1.64 mils of hold off at this wind speed and angle as long as the wind stays the same. Now this is something that I would recommend doing in hold off because your wind speed and direction is going to fluctuate in most circumstances. And so this is something you're going to want to adjust on the fly. It's going to be more difficult to re-index the optic and do the math. So uh, we're going to uh, encourage you to hold off for things that can change more quickly. Target lead and your wind can change at a moment's notice. So we're going to just use that for hold off. So for right now, I'm just going to cross that off because we're not going to index our winds. Now, our correction for spin drift is simply the correction value. That's a constant. doesn't matter which direction you're pointing. There's nothing really to adjust. So our spin drift at 1,500 meters is 1.4 minutes of angle. Okay. Same thing with our horizontal Coriolis effect. Uh, like we discussed in our Coriolis videos, it's simply the correction value. It's independent of direction of fire for your horizontal portion of your Coriolis drift. If you don't know what we're talking about, go ahead and check out that video. So we're just going to type that in there. About half a minute of angle for Coriolis. Okay, and the last thing here is going to be target lead. And that we're going to wait. That's to be determined based on... Uh, if the target's moving or not. And it's real simple. I have it set up in these primary functions. Your target lead is going to be half of a mil for every foot per second. So you can simply watch the target moving in the optic. If it uh, appears to cover six feet in a second, then you would take this number times six, and that's your lead. Or if it appears to be moving two feet every second, then you would take two times this number, and that'd be your lead. It's something you can determine very quickly in the field. So we're just going to leave that empty and fill it in as needed. So our final 
hold off, our current hold off is 1.64 and possibly a lead, so a question mark. And our final traverse indexed setting is going to be 1.95. And again, we're using a right hand twist rifle, okay? So that's a negative value. Uh, here, what we did is we assigned a negative and a positive value for right and left, just so we can keep track of these things, okay? So for our spin drift, if you got a right hand twist, you're going to have to adjust left. So that's uh, a negative value. And here, uh, we're in the northern hemisphere for Coriolis. Again, you're going to have to adjust left because it's always going to drift, appear to drift to the right. So that's a negative value. So this is going to be a negative. Uh, 1.95 negative being decoded up here as a left correction. So you're going to adjust your fire 1.5 or 1.95 left. You're going to index this part on your scope. This part's going to be separate from this because your wind could change. So all this is adjusted for you. You don't have to worry about it. Once that's in the scope, you're good because that's going to stay the same. However, your windage may change in your target lead. So we're going to keep that and hold off so that we can just quickly adjust for it just by moving our crosshairs. So that's basically how we fill out our calc form. So we have our final elevation value here. And here, like we said before, we're not doing any hold off. It's all indexed. And when it's all said and done, we're indexing some of our traverse setting and we're holding off for portions that are going to vary. So that's how you fill out a calc form.